All right, let's share screen and bring up the Noble Goldman principles. Okay, so can we all see mastermind, that? Mastermind. Okay. Yep. Uh, mastermind principles. The purpose of the mastermind is to learn leadership, build teams, and create multiple sources of income together. We are here to inspire and challenge each other to reach and exceed goals. Each member is committed to their own success as well as the success of every member of the group. We are committed to meeting in person or virtually for one hour every week. Uh, we are present. There is no multitasking or distractions during meetings. We are collaborative. We listen without interrupting, lecturing, or judging. We celebrate each other's successes without jealousy. I'm assuming this is back to me. <laughs> we are honest and participate by giving thoughtful feedback. We are open and listen to different perspectives without being defensive or offering excuses. We trust fellow members enough to share fully. We are focused, but we also think it's important to have fun during meetings. Uh, is it me? I think so. We are real and authentic. This is a no BS zone. We allow ourselves to become completely aligned with each other and the high forces, one mind, one soul, one love. Noble Goldman International is a conscious, aware, and engaged global community of abundance and freedom creators. Our mission is to create one million millionaires who are free from the time for money paradigm. We focus on creating multiple streams of income through masterminding, team building, and the effective utilization of the internet-based platform. Sorry, that's a mouthful. The mastermind becomes an opportunity for self-mastery where the self-transcendent shift from the me to the we to the us occurs. As congruence and engagement increases, the world's consciousness is then raised one meaningful and inspired relationship at a time. Very good. Thank you, everybody. So. All right. So, um, Vicky, if you can just keep an eye out for any latecomers as well, if we can make sure we let people. Yeah. Uh, no so, who are we missing? We're missing a couple of people from, no, we're missing Barbara from last week, I think. And now, was everybody that's here today here last week? No, I didn't realize there was even a meeting last week, so. Ah, okay, so we've missed you. All right, sorry about that. That's all right. Make sure we get you in on a, did you get a notification? No? I got a notification today and I was like, oh crap, I forgot that's tonight. Okay. <laughs> so I have to admit, I quickly breezed over agreement three and four. It is my second reading of the book, but all right. I'm not as up on it as I wish I was. So. Okay. No worries. Does anybody else, anyone else want to confess at this point that they haven't read yet? Um, ch chapters four and five. I listened to. Yes, yeah, same. <laughs> okay. It doesn't matter anyway because we'll go through it all, and uh, the discussion will will be invaluable anyway for people with whether you've read it or not. But it just it obviously resonates a little bit more if you have had a chance to read it. Uh, anyway, the the first recording from the when we did the intro and in chapter one is up on the page. The next recording I haven't had a chance to do this week, but I will sort that out over the weekend and then I'll get this one done as well. So you can go back and review whatever you've missed if there's anything you want to, to pick out from previous uh, discussions. So we've, we're up to chapters four and five now. So that means we've covered in the first session, we covered the, the preface, which was talking about the Toltecs. So a quick review uh, that it was their way of life. So all of this, this theory that we're reading is, is an actual practice, their way of life. The introduction talked about the smoky mirror, which was um, that we have this veil of fog, if you like, between 
um, between our our dream, our personal dream, and the dream of humanity and the planet. So we are taught, then it goes on to talk about domestication and the dream of the planet in chapter one. So we are taught how to dream the way that the rest of society dreams by those who have gone before. And that the word is very powerful and language is in itself is an agreement. We're making hundreds of agreements all the time. Uh, but these particular ones we're going to look at in this book, the four agreements are transformative if we can apply these to our lives. Uh, we keep doing what others do, what others want us to do in order to get the reward. So that has led to, in a lot of cases, a fear of being rejected or of not being good enough. And so we become our own worst inner critics and judges and we punish ourselves. I made the comparison to animals don't punish themselves over and over for making a mistake, but humans are the only creatures that do. And uh, we didn't necessarily choose all these agreements, but we've implicitly agreed to them by conforming. So then we went on to uh, chapters two and three. So chapter two covered the first agreement, which was be impeccable with your word. And by that the word meaning everything that we agree to everything everything in our language that we implicitly agree to and got a rustling noises in the background there. <laughs> is that julie have you joined us julie are you making rustling noises mm. <laughs> so uh your impeccability means without sin and it, he talks about sin being anything that you do which is against yourself so in other words being true to yourself and not not um blaming yourself or rejecting yourself uh, because that is an action against yourself then he said that whenever we hear an opinion and we believe it we make an agreement in that and it becomes part of our new belief system so we have to be careful about accepting other people's opinions as being true even our own opinions are not necessarily true and are subject to review depending on new information, new evidence. So always being impeccable with your word. That was the first agreement. The second agreement was don't take anything personally. Uh, we do tend to assume that it's all about me and that uh, in fact, nothing other people do is because of you. It's because of themselves. So we make up stories when we don't know what's going on there and we um we then make that agreement that that is the, the the way it was so it is your movie you can create your own life and you don't need to take other people's opinions or anything that happens personally and you're never responsible for the actions of others you're only responsible for your own actions so that's pretty much uh, where we were up to. We talked about fear. We cannot, uh, we, we cannot forgive ourselves for not being perfect. And that's something to work on by, um, by not taking things personally and by being impeccable with our word. So chapters four and five, quick, a quick I'll just pull out a few of the points. I'll maybe just start with chapter four, um, which was the third agreement. So don't make assumptions. So the problem that we have is that we believe that things to, are true. When we make an assumption about something that's happened, we then believe that it's true, but we don't necessarily know what other people are thinking. And we don't know what their agendas are. So we just make up these stories about what we think they think. And very often we think they're thinking about us and they're not thinking about us at all. They're thinking about themselves. And we only see, this is a quote, we only see what we want to see and hear what we want to hear. We have this need within ourselves to justify our own actions. So we make assumptions. And unfortunately, we assume that everyone else sees the world the way that we do. But we don't. We're all filtering it through our own beliefs and through our own experiences and through our own understanding of how the world is supposed to work. Certainly, that's very much what we're taught in NLP training is that everyone is looking at things from their own perspective. Uh, relationships we he, he, he put a great quote in here my love will change this person how many times do we hear that story 
about uh, people getting married and thinking, yes, I'll change this person that I'm married, marrying now to the way I want them to be, rather than accepting them for the way that they are. A few smiling faces on that one. And the same with us, we need to love ourselves for who we are. And the solution is if you are making assumptions, is to ask more questions. And also to, to be more specific with our language and to define this is what I want and this is what you want. And then looking for the win-win situation, the common ground. And he talks then about repetition of these new agreements that we're making will be transformative if we apply them. So that's the key points that I got out of the third agreement, chapter four. Anyone want to add anything to anything that they've just heard? Julie, you're trying to speak, but you're muted. <laughs> I know, I just realized that. Um, it was quite a short chapter and quite sort of succinct, wasn't it? Um, I think we just make assumptions all the time. And, um... Are you assuming that? <laughs> well, yeah, because it's all the inner talk, isn't it? In the head, it's, it's all assumptions. Well, a lot of it. Yeah, it's it's it, it it's so good to read this because it makes you aware of when you're doing it. You no, know, I um I really liked it. It does. It does definitely make you aware. I think that's that's the key point about anything that you want to change in the way you approach things in life is to first of all sort of uh, define what it is that you're doing that you you, you want to change and what it is that's occurring regularly for you and catch yourself doing it so to catch yourself asking and ask the question hang on a minute am i actually just making an assumption here about what this person's thinking or what they're why they're doing what they're doing and am i just making up a story here and that's that's a great question to ask yourself is am i making up a story well i, I think we do do that and i we, we always i think our natural tendency is to problem solve isn't it or or, or um um make things right or you know <laughs> know what to do or need guidance or <laughs> all these things um and so you know i mean the, today i'm waiting for a phone call so i'm sitting here thinking oh what will i do uh you know and that's why i'm late because i was sort of mucking around waiting for this phone call and it hasn't come so i'm making assumptions already you know and i don't need to do that so you're sitting there going, why hasn't this person called? What are they? Yeah, and yeah. getting annoyed <laughs> and getting annoyed as well. You they're know, probably getting doing this and they're probably thinking that. Yeah, exactly. And um, so I've, I've let that go. And then, then I saw the time, I thought, oh no, I'm late. <laughs> so that's what it did for me this morning. Maybe late, the assumptions. Do you know what I said to you last week, remember? Only disorganized people are late. Busy people are running behind schedule. <laughs> well all right then so being impeccable I, with your work i was i was running behind schedule she must be a busy person <laughs> anyone else want to add something to all that karen please or yeah i think you just i have just a quick little ditty um <clears throat> It's an old saying here in the States, when you assume you make an ass out of you and me. <laughs> and I heard this, I heard this when I was like 12 or 13, and it just always stuck with me. <laughs> so I always just, for one thing, it always helped me spell the word assume. And um, <laughs> so I never got that wrong on a spelling test. But I mean, it always kind of makes me when I go into assume, I kind of put the brakes on it for that reason. So that's something that's just kind of stuck in my brain for a very long time. A useful piece of information. <laughs> that was it. And have you found yourself applying that since, because you read the book some time ago, didn't you? I, I read it, I read it about three, four weeks ago. Um, I, I got it like a couple days before we started and I just sat down and read the whole thing. And I've only read the first two chapters with a highlighter. That's that's what takes me so long when I go through it that way. But um, I do catch myself, and it, but it is because of that phrase that I catch myself a lot. 
And I try not to assume because I really, really hate when people assume what I'm saying rather than ask questions. It really, really, it's a, it's a big aggravation point. I have a family full of assumers. So most of our arguments start with, don't assume you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so <laughs> so it's a, it is a bit of a bugaboo. I try not to do it. I think it's human nature to do it to a certain degree, but I definitely am on pretty high alert on not assuming. So <laughs> I thank my brothers for that. <laughs> Excellent. A family of assumers. I like that. <laughs> Nancy Ann, you, you had your hand up a moment, nanosecond behind Karen there before. Yeah, so this all reminds me very much of a, a conversation I had recently about knowing and not knowing what it is that we know and what it is that we don't know. And um, sort of was emanating from, it was this little blog post that I had written about the fact that, you know, at this point in my life, I realized that I've projected my reality onto others for a good portion of my life. I mean, this is notwithstanding having read Four Agreements and having the earth, sh you know, shake and all of that. But it's that I am only ever my own frame of reference. Mm -hmm all I really know to be true is my own experience, right? And so, um, yeah, and so it just, this just makes me, it just draws me sort of further into that idea that, you know, it's, and we laughed about how often we say, you know, and what does that even mean, right? And so what I love is that the moderator of that conversation she has kind of switched up to saying, instead of saying, oh, Tony, what I know about you, she'll say, well, what I'm, what I'm making up about you is that, and then she'll go on. And it's just so accurate, right? Because, and it's so accurate about so much of what we think we know about anything, really, is that, you know, I'm making up that. And so anyway, I just, I love it. And I think that um, it's, it's that idea of, of projection and our being really our own frame, our own and perhaps only frame of reference. Excellent. Yeah, I, I picked up that expression too from Brene Brown from reading her book and listening to oh. her. Text. She says it a lot. Uh, oh, maybe you, that's um, maybe that's where Petalin got it as well. But I love it when she says that because it's it's so accurate. For those who don't know, Brene Brown's an author who, who has done a lot of work around uh, shame and guilt and all of these sort of, should we call them nastier <laughs> emotions that we, we experience from our own inner mm -hmm. critic. And yeah, vulner vulnerability. She's, very, she's a very good storyteller. Yeah, so she, yeah, yeah vulnerability, thanks. That's another key one that she talks about. And uh, that, that we all tend to do that. We are making up stories. And I, I love that when she said, I, I picked up that expression as well, that, you know what uh, the story I may, I'm hearing or the story I'm making up here from what you're what I think you're thinking is and it's it's very powerful because it does it also enables you to be honest in your communication and to for them to give them the chance to to correct that and say oh no that's not the right story at all you know what I'm actually thinking is this because at least it gives you a buffer there to sort of say this is this is what I'm thinking that you're thinking. Can you verify that? And that's quite powerful because it, it does allow people to see how maybe their what they've said might have been misinterpreted or how they've come across or how their actions might have led you to think that. So it actually it opens that dialogue then for where they may have not expressed themselves clearly enough without being an attack. Exactly. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? Anyone had any examples? I read this book back in 2004 and I've read it a couple of times over the years. And, but I can tell you that I still every day catch myself realizing that I'm making up stories about what I think people think and why they didn't call back or why they uh, were, you know, offhand that particular day or something I'm like oh she's probably thinking this <laughs> they're not necessarily thinking what you think they're thinking at all 
And most of the time, they're not even remotely thinking about you. They've got their own stuff going on, <laughs> as, as we all have. And uh, so it's very easy to, to jump to those conclusions based on false assumptions. I just so, on the yeah. same note, in a, just, I'm in a period of my life where I need to reach out quite widely. And, and yes, I find myself, I, again, it's that self-projection. It's like a figuring, you know, if somebody doesn't respond to you, that, you know, filling in the blank and the whole story behind it. But just to what you just said, I feel like saying, hey, can you just think about me for a minute? <laughs> hey, can you think about me for a minute? Because, because the truth is, you know, they're not. <laughs> And that's okay to do that, I yeah. think. Yeah, you know, yeah. because sometimes we need to actually uh, let people know the impact of their yeah. either their communication or their non-communication, yeah. whether it's verbal or physical. Uh, we need to make people aware, and that's what he says in this um, in this book: is that when you when you and you ask questions, and then you state, "This is what I want. This is what I think that you want." Is am I correct there in or am I making an assumption? So how, how often do we, we think we know what the other person wants from whatever the, the interaction is? And, and as, especially at work, in workplace situations with colleagues or with the boss or with customers. Uh, so, and, and then of course, with your own family members at home, um, you know, if you've got a family of assumers, well, we've got a global family of assumers, actually. <laughs> We're all assumers. I'm assuming that anyway. So <laughs> we need to clarify, we need to, to express what we want. And that's another thing that I think we, we realize that we haven't done enough is, is making it clear what you're looking for in, in any situation. And by, by expressing that, it, it doesn't make you come across as, you know, as, as a know-all or as a, um, a demanding or difficult person to simply state, what you want out of that situation that transaction that that discussion and then to even to say i, I i'm making an assumption or i'm telling myself a story here that this is what i think you want am i correct in that so then it, it enables people to clarify and then you have by asking the question you both have you're on the same page then aren't you yes tony and i think a lot of the times we don't do that because we're scared the outcome might be um painful for us. There's a lot of fear comes into that, the assumption, especially if you've come from a past where you've, um, that, that's a, that, that has happened. Um, and also it's like the law, it's almost like if you do that, you're, you're almost putting it out there to be done to you. Do you know what I mean? It's just silly. Yes, we can actually attract the very thing that we're afraid of. Yep by not communicating, by being afraid yep. to ask a question, yep. like, you know, can you clarify what it is that you're thinking about here? Or what, what, what do you, so another simple question is, so what can I ask, what, what do you want from this situation? Yes. And then you get, well, you hope that they're gonna be honest in their communication and tell you what they're really thinking. Obviously and I think, most people don't. And I think this is especially the case these days with texting, because texting can also, just give the wrong impression you know it's not exactly accurate to always as to how you feel or you make a typo <laughs> absolutely Te oh, and auto correct is a great, <laughs> oh, <laughs> great oh, oh, also, one of the worst <laughs> inventions ever in some respects because you can I have think, I, think, I think you can turn it off but i've never learned how to yet <laughs> <laughs> You know, sometimes we need auto correct in our own vocabulary. I'm just stroking the dog in case anyone's wondering who my little oh. here is just stand up. It's the birthday boy. Birthday boy, yeah. Um, well, one of the things that um going back to what you were saying there is asking for what you want. Like if you state something and say, you know, is it it's my understanding that this is what you want. Am I am I right? You know, is that correct? Or yeah, I think a lot of it depends on um, the, your word selection and also your tone, because there's a lot of people in my life that you'll ask that, and I'll be like, you know, is is that what you want? Yeah, I guess so. And then because I'm not a big fan of indecision, so I'm like, 
you guess so, or that's what you want. Am I right or not? Is it's yes or no? It's not a you know. It's a yes or a no. And um, but it really, it always surprises me how many people are not willing to speak up for for what they want. My um, <clears throat> my in my in laws, who I'm still in touch with since my husband passed, they can go around a table when the family is together ten times easily. What do you, where do you want to eat? I don't know. Where do you want to eat? Where do you want to eat? Where, and I, I give it two rounds around the table. And then I'm like, we're doing pizza. We're doing pizza down the road. They've got beer. That's what we're doing. They're like, oh, that sounds terrific. Okay. You know, mm-hmm. because um, just some people are afraid to speak up or to make a decision. And like Julie said, it's out of fear of being wrong or, well, my mother-in-law, she's notorious for, I hate to pick the restaurant in case the food's not good. And I'm like, why you're not cooking tonight? <laughs> you know, so if it's not good, you send the plate back and ask for a menu and just, oh, I could never do that. And I'm like, why? Why do you want to pay money for food you don't like or can't eat? You know, I don't understand. I'm like that. I don't understand. <laughs> but she's just she, they're just like that, the two of them and the both of them, because there's been times where we've been somewhere and they will order something. and I'll be like, is that what you ordered? No, but it'll be fine. I'm like, but it's not what you wanted. Well, it'll be fine. It's okay. I can eat this. And, and I'm like, really? Because I can get the waiter back here and take care of this for you. Oh, no, no, no. We're good. We're good. And I, <laughs> I just can't, I can't understand that mentality. It's so easy to, to re-explain yourself or just, um, and again, like I said, Tony, you know, you don't, in order to not come off as a, as a know-it-all or, or being snotty or something, you just watch your tone on it, you know? I mean, it, it, you know, and you lay it out, you're like, is that, am I right on that? Do I, or a lot of times what I'll say, are we good? I said, that's just, a, that's just a New York thing. I don't know. We're, are we good? We're good? Okay, we're good. Let's go, you know, so. <laughs> but that's what I have on that. Well, you made a really good point there at the beginning as well uh, that I picked up on it. That was just that a lot of the time people actually don't know what they want. So you can make an assumption about what you think they want, but they don't, they haven't even figured it out yet themselves. Yeah. And uh, I, I so well, agree with that. And then they feel a bit badgered that we're trying to get an answer from them, almost bullied in a way, you know? Are you I, a bully, I, Julie? Some people think I might be. <laughs> I don't want to make an assumption there, but it just sounded that, that way. <laughs> no, but but I do understand because sometimes people are doubtful. And and I'm just while I'm listening to you talking about that, I'm thinking, well, you know, give them a bit of time to answer. And that's something I never used to do. I would always jump in before you give them time to answer because you know with a bit of silence sometimes people process things differently and they need to take a little bit longer to think about an answer and I'm always in a hurry to you know blah, 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 blah. and that's one so of the things it's I was part of the about. listening skills isn't it it's, it's part of our down. listening it's part of our listening skills to slow down and allow them some time to process what we've seen I was thinking with your mother with sending the meal back. She, um, you know, they just didn't do that. <laughs> my generation would never have done that. Either. My parents' generation would never have done that. But perhaps you, if you'd given her a little bit of time, she might have said, mm, why not? You know, <laughs> Maybe I could think about that. So I think 30 years later, she still, still doesn't do it. <laughs> yeah. Still, you know, you know what I'm saying here. Well, my wife did it. My wife did it the other day. We had a, she was ordered a coffee and they brought the girl misheard what she'd asked for. She asked for a matcha and she got a mocha and uh, <laughs> the restaurant owner said, Oh, would you like me to change? I can change that for you. I'll get you another one. And she said, no, it's fine. It'll be okay. I'll just drink this because she was happy enough with what she got and she didn't want to have to wait another 10, 15 minutes because they were busy at the time as well. And it was just, I'll take that because I'm, I'm not going to hang around waiting any longer. Did you get it free? <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> oh, you ladies, honestly. I know. <laughs> well, we're, 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 we're from a long line of badgers. <laughs> That's the end. 
Oh, I was just going to say, we had the same thing happen or similar um, when we were out to eat and my husband got the wrong plate or they brought him something different than what he ordered. It was the same thing because we had already waited some time for it. And then you're sort of, you know, you're eating at the same time. It was, so it's something that was okay with him. But then to your question about, did he get it? Did we get it free? They ended up bringing us the meal that he actually did order in a bag, which was like that's. Good. Well, that's sweet. That was sweet. That's sweet. Well, yeah. it is. I, and again, I guess we we got that part, but it was kind of interesting because you weren't necessarily going to go home and then eat <laughs> that meal too. Anyway. Oh, well, you can hear it tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Can that's I just true. pick up on? And he did. And he did. Thank you for that, Nancy. I'll just pick up on something that Joe wrote in the chat box there a little while back. Actually, yeah, the conversations carried on. Sorry, Joe, I had to had to hear what everyone else was saying there, but I did I did pick it up. Joe's written, "What are the relations between assuming and intuition?" That seems mm -hmm. like false intuition reading could be called assuming. Yep. We like to think of ourselves as intuitive, but mm -hmm. are we being intuitive or are we just making up a story? <laughs> Both. Well, I think we do have a certain amount. We, we all have a certain amount of intuition and well, we all have a lot more intuition. I'm going to make an assumption here. We all have a lot more intuition than what we're actually using. And a lot of it is, is down to the fact that, uh, again, I'll quote a, a, a statistic, you know, 67.3% of statistics are made up on the spot. So I'm going to say this one, <laughs> that 93% uh, 90, of your communication is actually nonverbal. So we're picking up on all sorts of signals from gestures, from um, from the color of your skin, the, the, there are all sorts of reactions that we, we intuitively pick up on because it, underneath it all, we are originally kind of animals, aren't we? So we're, we're tuned in to, we can tell whether someone's angry with us or annoyed with us without them saying a word. And I know women, are, well, it's alleged that women are better at this than men because of their ability to listen to, to babies. So a woman can hear a baby cry and go, oh, he's hungry or he needs his diaper changed or whatever. And the guy's like, how do you, how do you know that? Because <laughs> a baby obviously can't speak and yet you just do, don't you? <laughs> I'm sitting here with a room full of ladies here. Well, I've got, got Joe and Stan you back me up on that you guys <laughs> are <laughs> women learned. are women more intuitive than men that's a whole other debate isn't it <laughs> you might just know because you know you only just change their nappy and feed them so whatever they're upset about this they're tired because that's the next one the only one left <laughs> so it's just being pragmatic that's just blown i thought women were some had superpowers and now you're just telling me they just more information than i did oh well <laughs> there are both. both. Yeah. all right let's go on to the uh the next chapter then just to keep us on track with time which was always do your best so key points from that your best may depend on many factors and obviously if you are tired or you are sick you're not going to be performing as well as you would if you were in great physical condition had a good night's sleep were well fed well rested so being aware of those things can mean that your best may be the best that you can do at that time given all of those circumstances and therefore uh, also that doing your best if you do your best consistently, if you make that one of your mantras to do your best all the time, then you are less likely to find yourself judging yourself for falling short of your best because you know you did your best. Meditation, he talks about, there's not everything uh, because we can be so busy trying to meditate that we forget to live, love and be happy. Take action because you love it, not just for the reward. And if you are attached too much to the rewards um, and then you, you fall short of what you're trying to achieve and not doing your best, this is where it can lead to escapism, uh, drunkenness, and uh, probably watching Netflix, another one of those things. Um, so doing your best, learning from your mistakes, practice, and doing that will make you happier. This was an interesting 
a quote I wrote down, well, whatever life takes away from you, let it go. Let it go. Say no or yes when you want to. Don't just go along with the flow of what other people want. Uh, have your own have your own voice and don't be afraid to use it. Be present. Don't spend your time wallowing in the past or worrying about stuff that may or may not happen in the future. Respect your body. I like this. It was a, it's a manifestation of God. Your body is the one you've been given to get through this journey. So look after it and choose today to honor these four agreements. And here's a great one. If you, if you do find yourself breaking one of these agreements, be kind to yourself. Just start again. It's we're all human. We all do make mistakes. We all make assumptions. We all are sometimes not impeccable with our word. And um, what was the other one? We, we all take things personally sometimes when we know we shouldn't. So we're all human. And uh, if you can take this one on board to always do your best, then you can forgive yourself for making those errors and just start again and do better next time. There you go. That's my summary. What, is, what does anyone else want to say about that? I think that's a very good summary. I also found with that one um, that what I took from it the first time I heard it was um, that I do my most and to just stop doing my most and actually look at just slow down and what can I do my best at and do that. And if I can't do my best at it, perhaps I don't do that today, which is quite outrageous for me. But yeah, so I really like hearing that from it. Is that the wisdom of maturity kicking in? <laughs> <laughs> or laziness? <laughs> oh, I, I think I, I believe, yeah, like right. I'm, I'm going to make an assumption, but I believe that it is because I think that we, you know, certainly I was guilty of this in my own experience in my past being a workaholic and like thinking I've got to do all this stuff. And then when you start slowing down and thinking, hang on, do I really need to do this? Is it yeah. really the end of the world if I don't get this done today? If I could, if I do it tomorrow or I rearrange the schedule. So, you know, and being kinder to yourself, mm. I think when, especially when you're younger and you're very, well, again, I'm making an assumption here, aren't I? Some people are very motivated very young and other people are motivated older i don't know yeah well, that's i true. found yeah. certainly i was i was motivated and i was pushing myself all the time to do all this stuff and then you think well do you really need to mm. yeah. it's better to just be present and enjoy the moment and make the most of this, what we have now almost like martyrdom huh? isn't it mm. yeah. yes yeah very much for me yeah I and if you, resent, with a lady. if you really resent doing something, then you're best not to do it, you know, you're best to, to take a breath and, um, you know, otherwise it's kind of like a form of slavery. Yes, yeah, slavery to your own mm -hmm. ambition, perhaps. Yeah. To, and your own assumptions. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. A lady I worked with who used to say, can I smell burning? And you go, what? She go, yeah, I can smell a burning martyr here. <laughs> <laughs> i think it's important to remember that our best um which she mentions that is a, on a sliding scale you know some days you just feel super fantastic and then yeah. other days you're like oh, i'm gonna be happy if i can just muddle through this um and then corlu like you said too or maybe it was julie some days that's not the day for that project I've had a lot of times like that. Like I have a very large property here that I maintain myself. And I used to really push, push just right up till two years ago. And just, I got to get this done. I don't want to deal with it tomorrow. I'm just going to push and go. But I, I just, and I just said exactly what you said to me. <laughs> Does it really matter if I get this done today? Is it so earth shattering that I get all this done today? My body is killing me. I'm sweating to death. I'm starving. Is it really that important that I drag one more wheelbarrow of dirt across a half an acre of land? And it's like, no, it's not. So now this year, it's kind of funny because I've gone, I've done such a 180 because my mom lives with me and she'll be like, 
were you going to weed that garden? I'm like, yeah, you know what? It'll eventually bloom into some sort of wildflower. A pollinator will love it. Just leave the damn thing. You know, I'm not dealing with it today. I don't have time. It's hot. You know? so, and it's definitely an age thing because the older I get, the less my tolerance is with the heat and humidity out there. I'll just open the door. And I'm like, oh, it's humid. I'm not going out of the house today. That's it. I'm going downstairs to my office, you know, or whatever. So, but it's definitely a sliding scale. And, and as he pointed out that when you're so busy pushing, doing, going, you do miss some of the best bits of life. You're not, you're not present. You're not enjoying things. You're not, you're not leaving room for everything. You're, you're just like, it's like just eating potatoes for dinner instead of, you know, potatoes and veg and what have you, you know? So it's, um, and that's something I've had to work on a lot was being kinder to myself and whatnot. And, um, and accepting that some days my best, the bar is not as, I haven't reached the highest bar that I want, but I, I, I have a terrible, I'm much better at it now, but still an issue of raising the bar too high on myself and um, demanding physical things from me and mental that I would never expect from somebody else. It's like, I would never ask somebody to do all this. And it kind of mm -hmm. just dawned on me in the last year or so, then why do you expect it of yourself? Who are you that you're so grand that you should be the one that has to, the one person on earth that has to do everything and take care of it all in one day. And I, so I just really started backing off of that. And I have to say, I'm a lot happier too. I feel better and I'm a lot happier. So must be working somewhere. Now that's awesome. a great, great point. I, I love that, that about the, the wheelbarrow of dirt across the land. Because how, how often do we, put that I mean that's part of how we drive ourselves to do anything in life is we put a certain amount of self-pressure on there to motivate us to get stuff done otherwise we'd all just sit around contemplating our navels and never do anything so we have to do a certain amount of pushing ourselves but then I think as we get a, a little bit more mature we start to go hang on a minute I used to do all that for years did it really get me any further forward to flog myself into the ground to get stuff done by a you know, a self-imposed deadline. I find that I do that even with the NG stuff. The sort of, you know, like we've started this 30-day quest and there's all the things that you need to do every day. It's like, oh, yeah. And that's a great tool. How am I tool. actually going to do and how right. good am I doing? I was just going to say that. Uh, that's a great point you've raised there, Coralie, because Mark Santos is one of the the best people I know at talking about being kind to yourself and that that's part of I think why the quest was designed is to get you to do more than you've been doing perhaps or for some people to start doing something that they've never done but then also to be realistic enough to go I won't get everything on the list done every day because that's just <laughs> well you might but it's very rare i don't know about the rest of you but i've done the quest a couple of times and i just found that i couldn't get through everything every day but if you did 10 things you wouldn't have done that's still you still move forwards yeah but mark talks a lot about the the movement of the the moon the moon cycles mm -hmm. and the, the impact on our energy levels and so on and that's why we get these days where we are really vitalized and empowered to do things and other days we just want to lie on the couch and not really do very much at all. And that's okay. It's actually okay to acknowledge that in yourself that today I'm not going to be at my best. So that thing that's going to require that drive and energy might be better waiting till the next day when I am up to, to doing that. Yep. And some days those days are your body just telling you rest. You just need to... I mean, I used to not listen to my body as well, and it would just drop me. You know, I'd sit down, I'm going to sit for a minute, and then wake up three hours later with my neck killing me, and I'm like, oh, I really wish I just went to bed. Why did I think I was going to do more tonight, you know? And so, um, so it is important to listen to your body, because, I mean, if you don't listen to your body, it'll drop you. <laughs> just that's that you know isn't it great that it does that though you know the body does have a way of letting you know hey come on you need to get some sleep or you need to just uh, calm down or you need to go and take a shower or something you need you need to do something different and it will if you don't if you keep ignoring the warnings 
it will floor you. It'll make you shut down. <laughs> it's a clever thing, isn't it? Mm. It's an amazing cool. machine. So, yeah, anything else from the uh, always do your best chapter? Or anything that you've uh, learned or applied from the four agreements so far? Do you know, there's something something to be said by having a, mind you, I suppose that's a woman, of having a tantrum now and again and throwing some plates. I guess that's a form of doing your best as well. <laughs> yeah, maybe it is good sometimes to let out how you're feeling. If you're frustrated or you're angry or, you know, um, going and throw a plate is better, not at somebody, obviously, but going throw it <laughs> or, or, I don't know, <laughs> Hit something, <laughs> throw something, have a and, little energy. And, and the expression, yeah. like the NLP expression is, according to whom? <laughs> the best according to whom? Yeah. Yes. Vicky, you were going to say something? I was just going to focus on it, be impeccable with your word. So if I say I'm going to do something, I do it. And if I don't, I, I apologize. <laughs> just because... Life gets in the way sometimes, and that's okay. And there's nothing wrong with saying, I'm really sorry. I've been really busy. I'll get back to you. I know I promise you I'll do whatever. Um, I think sometimes we all take on more than we should just because of who we are. And I see Julie nodding. <laughs> so I'll admit, oh, I'm really sorry. I told you I would do that, and I didn't get to it. And that's okay. But I think overall, we should focus on our, not just our word, but our feelings, our emotions, and um, that intuition. I think intuition for me is super, super important. That's what I'm gonna say. Take an internal weather forecast. Yeah. So sometimes we have to trust that internal guidance that maybe doesn't make sense, but that intuition, like little antennas going up is telling us to do something and we need to trust it, even though the other part of us is like, eh. but this, this part is, uh, you know, I, I see Karen smiling, but um, intuition I think is super important. And sometimes I don't, I think if we don't follow that, we don't follow that intuition internal guidance it's going to come back to bite us like yeah. we should just trust it because it's it's right i don't know how else to put that but i find this for me lately especially if i don't trust it i'm going to pay the price later i should just trust it because and it's what, right what's the price you're going to pay it's either going to take them longer or something is going to happen or <laughs> Um, my example, I, I, I have to move, right? I, not I have to, I'm, I've chosen to move because I feel it's calling, but Quebec is putting rules in place that I need to move sooner than I had planned because they're putting a passport vaccination thing, whatever. I respect everybody's decision, but I'm not getting the vaccine. That's my choice. It means I need to move sooner because I need to get out before they put this rule in place. And I trust my intuition. My intuition has been telling me for a while I need to get out. And, um, you know, sometimes your, your intuition tells you one thing and then the rest of you says, oh, we can go another week. We can go another two weeks or whatever. And maybe we can't. We have to really trust that initial uh, guidance. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm just using my own example. So yeah. like, as of yesterday, I need to be out of here as soon as possible because Quebec is putting rules in place that no other province in Canada is putting in place. So, And, and that's happening worldwide and people are not yeah. even objecting. They're just letting it happen, aren't they? And I don't know what there is with human rights that they can actually even um, put, a, put a rule out like that, you know? Um, I don't know. Um, and just don't go to the crowded places then. 
I mean, I've had the same this week. There's an enormous amount of anger around from those that have the vaccination that how dare you now put us at risk because you haven't, mm. you know? And um, we still don't know. You know, people have had the vaccination and they've still got it. So you don't even know it's the protection. You know, it's, it's all about power and control. And it worries me too, you know, worries me big. I, you know, I'm about to go back to Europe and, and you know, I'm going to have to have the vaccine. That's it, bang. I've actually come to terms with it now. I don't like it, but, mm. and, you know, I can't, I can't bear any longer this feeling of being chucked on the, you know, chucked out or anything like that. So, yeah. That's actually why I got it was because um, my son lives in uh, Hawaii and it's 12 hour flight for me and I wouldn't be able to fly to see his family or my granddaughter. So it's like, and you know, people can say, well, you caved or whatever, but the fact of the matter is I go out there usually for two weeks, once a year, and if you're not vaccinated, you have to do a two week quarantine mm -hmm. and huge cost. But you have to do that in New Zealand anyway. You have to do that Surprisingly in enough, though, Hawaii, the <laughs> Maui, my son said the Maui Police Department's actually doing their job, Mom. He goes, if you can believe it, because they were picking up tourists and it's a $5,000 fine. They take you to jail, you post your $5,000 fine, and they drive, the police drive you to the airport. Because there's such a, you know, small group of islands and stuff. I mean, he's, I talked to him the other day. It was crazy. Because he said, because he knows I'm always revolting against things. He goes, are you going to fight this thing and make this a headache, like, for the whole family? I'm like, if it wasn't for my granddaughter, yes, I would. But I want to see my granddaughter live and in person, so I'm doing it. I said, just know that. And he just, he goes, okay, he goes, as long as you got the damn thing, he goes, I don't even care. He goes, I figured you'd be at the top of the list screaming and yelling and carrying on about it. I go, I want, and I want to travel more too. And it's going to come down to, you're not going to be able to get on a plane without one. And I can't drive everywhere. I have no problem driving, but you can't drive everywhere. The, so. the, the, the stupid part about it is that it doesn't stop you from getting it, apparently, especially the new variants and things. So it's not stopping. People well, they say it doesn't stop it, but you don't get as sick. But one of the things that I have to laugh at um, in my area here, because it's so it's very political, and um, I live in a conservative area, and I am not conservative. And so, um, but people will be like, "Oh, you you got the vaccine? You shouldn't have gotten the vaccine." I'm like, "Well, have you looked at what's in that Big Mac you're shoving down your throat?" I probably took less poison in that shot than you did in that hamburger that you probably eat five times a week, you know? And so that, that always starts a whole other discussion. I'm very popular in the little town that I live in. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, but I mean, you know, it, it all has to be put in perspective. Like I said, I did it because I want to get on a plane and see my granddaughter. And it's going to come that we're going to, uh, you know, you're going to get strong armed into it to a certain degree, unfortunately. And I mean, my mom is 81 and she lives with me too. And I'm like, do I, you know, you read all the information and of course it's disinformation. Some of it's what's real, what's not. But I'm like, at the end of the day, because I have lost family members to COVID. So I'm like, but at the end of the day, do I want to risk getting her sick and not being able to see my granddaughter? So those were... One strike, two strike, okay, just get the shot. So that's what I did. But as long as you can drive everywhere, Vicky, you go, girl. <laughs> well, I'm absolutely with you, Vicky. I wouldn't have the shot, except like Karen's just said, they're gonna make it in Australia that you can't do anything. Like they're talking about bringing in, you can't go to the pub, you can't go to the sporting events, can't go to concerts. So you, you know, your life will be changed. You'll be ostracized from everything if you don't comply and I want to travel, I've got a huge bucket list. So, and also we're looking after my stepson who's got uh, epilepsy. And if, if he catches it, it could have horrendous implications for him. So yeah, my wife who is completely against it, went and had her first shot the other day and hated doing it, but it's the way it's going. You just, you can't really fight it. So 
I got the same thing. I got the same story. I got a, a daughter who lives in France and I'm here in the States. And uh, my elderly mother has, she lived with us for the last four years. She just moved into assisted living, but I'm there a lot. I'm surrounded by very vulnerable folks. But it really came down, and this is kind of an irony, right? Because we want to preserve our personal freedoms. But what are our personal freedoms for each one of us, right? So like you said, you know, Vicki, if you're like, I don't, you know, I'll drive where I need to go. I totally get yep. that. My husband, <laughs> my husband still hasn't gotten the vaccine. I totally honor that. But I just knew for me, what would feel heavier is this idea of like, am I not going to be able to do just the stuff that I want to be able to plan and do? And I just didn't want to deal with that, that whole, the barrier thing. And yeah. And I think that, you know, then I just went about it with faith, like with faith. I have faith that God has my back going. With it. <laughs> and and France is France their Let down. me just qualify that by, and again, Vicki, I'm not saying you don't have, I'm just, you know, I hope you oh, know I'm that. not, I'm, I, I, yeah, I take no, no I am not no, saying don't anybody worry. doesn't. Didn't assume, I just, okay, she didn't assume anything. Right, I didn't, I didn't <laughs> right, but I, I don't want to assume anything, because sometimes this, this is a really hot topic, and, you know, it, is. it can be Please very stop. polarizing, and, and, and things that come out of our mouths can be polarizing when we don't mean them to be, yeah. and so I just want you to know that that's just my personal brand. Of and I think it is a personal thing, it is a personal thing, yeah. and you it have is. to be at peace with it, and it doesn't matter what others think, it's your own personal thing, really. It's almost like a religion, though, isn't it? it? You know how uh, over the years, <laughs> over the centuries, mankind has fought over, no, you've got to believe in my God, because my God's the one that's, yep. you know. <laughs> my true God. I would like to know from people that have had it, how do you feel? How Did you get sick from the vaccine? Well, when I, I'll share something very interesting. I had a COVID test today mm. because... I'm feeling under the weather this week. And I did it specifically because we were planning a trip up to see one of my siblings with my mom. And, and then the siblings that I'm going to visit, he and his wife are not vaccinated. And the wife has a particular immune condition that makes her not want to have the vaccine. So we've got vulnerable people. And mm -hmm. lo and behold, earlier this week, I start to feel head congestion, you know, and, and yesterday I was like, you know, I called my brother. Turns out it's just not, it wasn't the thing to do for us to go. So my husband and I bowed out. Um, but then I was like, well, then I might as well go get the test, right? And see. So I did get a COVID test today and I have been feeling under the weather and I won't be surprised either way. I won't be surprised at the result really. So Bearing in mind that a lot of the COVID tests are very seriously suspect. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to go. In, I'm not going to go into that. There's <laughs> that too. Yeah, right. I don't. I don't I, my brain can't handle that part, Julie. But it's appreciated. Just get so, it in so, your head. You've got to protect the people who've had the vaccine because so, uh, they I'm might just catch gonna, it. Oh, well, yeah. Well, <laughs> that's true. And that's the thing, because there's a lot of breakthrough infection. And I, and I understand it's likely not nearly as serious. I, I hope that that's true, but it's like... Well, people have to remember, too, there's this, the common cold is still out there. Of course. Allergies yeah. are still out there. I sneezed the other day in a store, and like six people backed away. I said, relax, <laughs> there's stuff blooming in my yard. Just relax, everyone. <laughs> you know, it's just so Karen, crazy. Because everyone's like, oh my God, you sneezed. Or if they bump into you, I'm like, Karen, did you have the mask on too? <laughs> you have the mask on. I did one of these because we don't have, the, we just had the mask mandate lifted, but we're going back oh. to it soon. But okay. I mean, and people bump into you and I'm like, relax. No one's ever been cleaner than we are right now. We're all sanitized from head to toe, you know. But Corley, I did want to get back to you. Um, I got the Pfizer two shot. The first shot, just sore arm, fine the next day. The second shot kind of knocked the piss out of me for a couple of days. I slept for 30 hours. I couldn't stay awake. 
I didn't have any body aches or anything. I was just exhausted. And because my mom's like, do you need to go to the hospital or whatever? I'm like, no, I know I haven't slept like this since I was probably three months old, but I just can't stay awake. Just please feed the dog and open the back door and let her out. I said, I just, I, I was just, just no energy. Took me about 48 hours to get my energy back, but I was pumped for about a week. Not, not sick, just kind of, ugh, you know, yeah. and, yeah. um, but once I cleared that, I was fine. Now I've had family members that got sick on the first shot and family members that got nothing on both. So I, you know, I think it's just a, it's a, you know, we're all different chemically too. People have to remember that too. We still get sick from other things that are not COVID and everybody's chemistry is different. So, um, yeah. you know. Karen, so, I've, no. I've found a way of being rebellious but still complying. And that is in Australia at the moment, if there's two vaccines, you can have the AstraZeneca or you can have the Pfizer, but they've brought in a law that it, you can only have the uh, the Pfizer if you're under 59 and I just turned 60. Oh, so so I, I rang my doctor to see if there was any way I could get the Pfizer because I'm in a carer situation. And uh -huh. he said, no, we can't, but it, we, it is coming that they're basically they're waiting to run out of AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca is the one that other countries have rejected as being unsafe, yeah. by the way. And yes. that's why I, there's no way I am taking that, even though they're trying to push me to take that one. So, but they're going to run out of that. And then everyone's going to get Pfizer from about September or October onwards. So I'm just waiting to get that one. So that's my little last bit of rebellion to wait and get the vaccine that I'm choosing. If I we kind of ended up, <laughs> we waited by default. I live, I, I live in the country. It's isolated. I, I have property. I don't need to see anybody if I don't want to. I work from home. Really not a lot of my life changed other than meeting people for drinks. But, um, and, you know, my brothers would call, did mom get a shot? Did mom get a shot? I'm like, we can't get an appointment. I said, just relax. I said, besides that, I'm waiting to watch the fallout. I said, let me just see. I want to see how many people kick it or get really sick before I totally commit to this. I said, but we can't, we could not get an appointment. She's 81 and I couldn't get an appointment. I couldn't get through online. And I couldn't, when I, when I would stop in, I couldn't definitely not on the phone, I'd stop in. And because we didn't get ours until uh, the end of May. Because then she started in March. We, are we going to get it? Do you think we're going to, I'm like, relax. You're not leaving the house anyway. Walk around the yard, breathe air. And um, it, these appointments, you know, let's let them rush through. Let's just let the fall out and see where it will be. And I said, because if I don't like the way things are looking, I'm, I'm not getting it. And, um, but because Pfizer was what our area had, that's what, it was so weird because all these uh, major drug stores, well, God, everyone was doing them. So I'm like, I'm not pulling up in the street and getting a shot in the street. I'm sorry. I have, I, I just really, I don't like that. I think it's crazy. I don't even like the fact that the drug stores are doing the flu shots. Um, because my previous husband, he, we were at his doctor's office and they sent us to a drugstore to get his flu shot. I, I, I said, why can't you do that here? Oh, we don't do that. I said, so I have to lead a clean medical facility and go to a dirty drugstore and hope that the hoo-ha over there knows what the hell they're doing with a hypodermic needle. I said, so that, that's what meant. I am very anti-established medicine. I do everything holistic. I keep myself as healthy as possible. And, and, and she's like, yes, that's the way it is. And you should have it too. I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. Well, we ended up in this little tiny private pharmacy. It was great. The place was great. We were like in and out. I said to the guy, it says here in the paperwork, we have to sit for five or 10 minutes. He goes, he, I, I said, cause in five or 10 minutes, I'll be home. He's like, no, you'll be fine. <laughs> okay, I know. It, was just, it was crazy but Pfizer seemed to be what we had in this area so and I think that's kind of how it was distributed I don't think Nancy I don't think the AstraZeneca is even here in the U.S. is it I it's Moderna so. or Pfizer because yeah, AstraZeneca was banned by the U.S. wasn't it it was rejected that's what I was yeah. thinking yeah yeah but we took it on in Australia we because America didn't want it we we went oh we'll have it <laughs> it was probably cheaper 
Yeah, probably. I was going to say, was it free? <laughs> yeah. Was it as effective either of them? So anyway, we're at time, guys. I just wanted to bring attention to that. Um, it's it's an interesting topic that is very divisive and in some ways exemplifies everything that we've been talking about with these four agreements here because we do need to be impeccable with our word and be and watch the impact of our words on other people. Where we, like Nancy Ann said, we may inadvertently cause a big debate or something or offend somebody by talking about it so we have to pick and choose our battles there and don't and, gossip and and respect that everyone has a different opinion or a different uh, experience that they're drawing upon we're all we're all going by our own experiences of who we know who's had the vaccine or who hasn't or who's got sick or who hasn't all those sorts of things so don't again don't take anything personally because that person is filtering it through their uh, their own interpretation of things um, then uh, don't make assumptions about what you think that they think or or what what might happen or what they think might happen and always do your best so we've got the four agreements there in contained even within that one topic but just generally going forwards if you can apply these four agreements to your life it will be transformative and it will be a case of you won't get it right every day but you'll catch yourself more and more, the more you're tuned into it, you'll catch yourself realizing, I, did I just make up a story there? Did I make an assumption? Did I follow through with what I said I was going to do? All those things. Was I being kind to myself? Am I being overly critical of myself? So applying it will make a big difference. We will carry on. Uh, next week there is, uh, chapter six is the breaking old agreements. And... We'll do a sort of summary of the book in as, as a total. Um, and then I'm thinking we'll have a, another book for the for the week after that. I didn't mean this to be just become a book club, but I've realized that there are I've got a list there of certain books that I believe are must read books. And this is one that I would put on that list along with Think and Grow Rich. So there's a few different ideas we've got for, um, for other books that we could follow on with. But I thought maybe it might be a useful one for, for this Noble Goldman work that we're doing, that we perhaps look at how to win friends and influence people. Oh, yes, my Dale Carnegie. I haven't read so, that one in decades. <laughs> yeah, so I think that might be a good one to go back and revisit. So just planning ahead there. So you've got a fortnight to um, to, to think about that one and to get, get a copy if you don't have a copy of it. It's available everywhere, any, any good bookstore so um thank you everyone for your contributions today and it's been great talking to you all and hope to catch you all next week anyone got any last thoughts they want to say before we finish up i uh, just send joe our love and healing thoughts for troy and you guys for keeping it all together thank you very much i will pass that on all right Wonderful. thanks everyone bye have a great week you too. Bye.